So in this last part here, we are trying to figure out uh, the things that make a uh, nucleus more stable and less stable. And in order to do that, we're going to use these binding energy numbers to tell which ones are more stable and which ones are less stable. Now in order to get this number, what we did is we first found the change in mass so it was basically final isotope mass minus individual protons and neutrons. Now when we did that, we got a, a negative number. And everything we've done in chemistry so far, that would scream horrible things. But in this version of science, we can actually use that difference in mass to calculate the difference in energy upon making it. And uh, if you've ever had a job and stuff, which I'm sure most of you have, you go to a job so you can get money, all right? You don't just do it for fun, all right? You look, we want the reward and then the power that comes with getting the money to do your thing. In science, the equivalent is atoms just don't form because they want to. There's a reason, all right? And in science and in energy, it usually means that energy is being released, exothermic reactions. And this isn't just a little exothermic, this is really exothermic. This is one of the biggest numbers we've seen in these classes. So these big negative numbers, especially like this one right here, just show that, yeah, the atoms want to form, all right? There's a reason why they form. They don't just form because they feel like it, all right? There's actually energy being given off, which is usually important. <clears throat> now, furthermore, we took that energy, we turned it into a positive number turn joules into kilojoules. And finally, if you divide by the number of nucleons, which is just the number of pieces in the nucleus, so it's basically all the protons and neutrons together, so in this case it's two, uh, that gets you these energies, which are the binding energies per nucleons. And we'll use this here in the next slide. Uh, any questions on this stuff so far? Okay, so deuterium here, 1.08 times 10 to the 8th kilojoules per mole of nucleons. Scientists have created graphs like this, and I want to talk about what this is too. So first of all, this is the binding energy, the binding energy y-axis, and on the x-axis you have the mass number of the atoms. So right down here would be hydrogen with one. Here's hydrogen two. It's hard to see down there, but you can tell it's pretty low. And if you look at all of the different atoms, there's kind of a curve right here. So uranium 238's here, here's lithium seven, et cetera, et cetera. And notice here on this binding energy curve, the kind of top part of the curve is right around here, right around iron 56. So when you look at all of the isotopes known, helium-4, carbon-12, chromium-53, iron-56, uranium-238, et cetera, et cetera, you get this kind of curve. And the high point of the curve is right up there. Now this is really interesting if you think about it long enough, and scientists have thought about it, because iron-56, iron with a mass number of 56, that's the most stable element thermodynamically, all right? And once something forms iron 56, it basically stays iron 56. And in astronomy, if you've studied the lifetime of stars, all right, even the big supernovas and stuff like that, once they get to iron, once they get to iron 56, that's the end of the sun. All right, the sun no longer has enough energy to turn like iron uh, maybe into zinc or copper normally. All right, iron 56 is kind of the end point of all things. And that's really fascinating because what that means, if all the elements essentially want to be like iron 56, that means that one day all of our carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, caffeine, et cetera, et cetera, it's all gonna turn into iron. And when it turns into iron, that's the end. No more transformations after that. So that's a little bit nihilistic at this point because wow, you get to iron, that's basically the end of everything, all right? Now, in an earlier lecture, we talked about how all graphite is, or all diamond is gonna turn into graphite, all right? And oh, you know, end of the world and stuff like that. But I also told you at that time, I said, don't go selling all your diamonds because 
the transformation of diamond into graphite takes thousands upon thousands of years. And if you have your diamonds now, your children's 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 children will be able to appreciate those diamonds as well. It's that slow. It has that high of an energy of activation. Well, for our carbon and oxygen and nitrogen to become iron 56, that energy of activation, orders of magnitude higher than that, all right? So all of us maybe one day a gazillion years, and I mean gazillion with the highest order of magnitude now, a gazillion years from now, yeah, it's gonna be iron 56, but that's gonna be eons, all right? The lifetime is forever, thanks to kinetics, all right? That huge energy of activation is gonna slow that reaction down so that it's really nothing that any of us have to worry about on our lifetime or our children's 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 lifetimes, all right? But it is kind of fascinating to think about because if all the elements wanna be like 56 iron, iron 56, that's what's gonna happen. So, elements that have less than 26 protons want to be more like iron 56, and they're gonna undergo something called fusion, we'll talk about in a little bit. On the other hand, the iron, the elements that are larger than iron, which are like uranium, neptunium, stuff like that, tungsten, those are all gonna become like iron through something called fission, all right? And all the elements, like I said, are gonna end up one day at iron 56, but man, the kinetics is slow. So nobody go home tonight and think, oh, end of the world as we know it. I, no, don't do that, <laughs> all right? <laughs> all right, these are like so far out there in time, all right, that we don't have, but it is kind of interesting to think about how the universe maybe will progress one day. Questions? All right, so even though this is a little bit like, you know, end of the universe kind of thing, the kinetics of the thing is so slow that none of us have to worry about it. And in the meantime, it gives us a chance to think about other things. Maybe we're missing parts in the theory. I think you had a question. Oh, um, yeah. <clears throat> so, like with the new telescope that went out uh -huh. and all that, yeah. uh, have they seen like any other universes like, where a planet has like, had like all of their elements turn into one element? Good question. And the answer is no. Um, there's like some collections of iron that have formed from super energetic processes. So everything did that together, as I understand. But no, there's no planets or anything, even a planet size. I think they're more like asteroid size. So, you know, you're seeing evidence of it here and there, but they're still pretty rare. And so on an astronomical scale, it's incredibly rare, which is another reason that there's nothing to stress out about. Good question. But that's also why I find astronomy kind of interesting, because I'm thinking about everything going to iron in the back of my mind, you know, and, and what it takes to get it there. And, uh, but so far, yeah, nothing like that, so good. If nothing else, when you look at the whole universe, the dominant element is still hydrogen, the simplest one, right? And there's a lot of helium, and then everything else is a lot less. So, um, so there's still a long ways to go before we got to something like this. Cool. All right. Now, a question that you might see is which of the following nuclei has the highest binding energy per nucleon? And one thing you could do is you could look these kind of numbers up on Google or something like that. But honestly, all you have to do is find the element which is closest to iron 56. So on the periodic table, is lithium, nickel, helium, or thorium, do you think, closest to iron? Nickel, yeah. So nickel would be what you would predict. Now, I went to the internet, because I don't know any of these numbers, and I looked up the different binding energies. Now these are in what's called a mega electron volt, and there's about 10 to the 13th joules per mega electron volt if you want to convert. But either way, the nickel 59 was the highest one, right? that has the highest binding energy. But you don't really have to do this. You just want to find the element which is closest to iron. And I'm not talking like down to up, you know. So like uh, ruthenium versus cobalt, cobalt would be the one because it's literally closest and stuff in mass, so. All right, so now what we'll do is we'll talk about fission and fusion a little bit because those are the things that help make the atoms more like iron eventually. And the first one we'll look at here is fusion. And uh, I'm super excited as a human being and as a scientist about fusion. Um, a lot of our energy right now, of course, comes from gas-powered things, which have carbon dioxide emissions, greenhouse gases, and stuff like that. F 
fusion is pretty cool because you take two light elements and you fuse them together to make a heavier element. Now the elements have to be less than iron, but what's often done is they'll just use hydrogen or helium, something like that. All right, pretty chill. And the amount of energy that's released is just massive, all right? So this is deuterium and tritium, two hydrogen isotopes combining to make helium four and a neutron. And again, a lot of energy is really happening. Now, fusion is different than fission. So if you've heard about the problems with nuclear power, they're usually referring to fission, which we'll talk about later. Fusion, if anything bad happens to a fusion reactor, you just literally shut it down and you'll have hydrogen floating around, which you don't want to snow smoking, all right, and maybe some helium, so that would, but that's about it, all right, and the stuff will dissipate quickly. Uh, it's pretty chill. Now, you do need super high temperatures and you need something called plasma, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which is hard to make, but it's a very clean energy, all right, it's super clean, all right, solar and plasma, I think would be just so cool to have. And the more, I enter, the more stuff I see about uh, solar and plasma, the more excited I get. So we'll talk a little bit here about what fusion is. And also, there's been some pretty cool results about fusion here lately. Now, in order to understand fusion, though, we have to talk about plasma. And this isn't the plasma that people want when you go and donate blood for money. All right? That's a blood plasma. It's like a concentrated version. Plasma, in this context, is actually a whole fourth state of matter. So we've spent so much time in Chem 222 talking about gases, solids, liquids, solutions, stuff like that. Well, plasma is a fourth state of matter. And even though it's rare on the Earth, in the universe, it's the most common form <laughs> because all of our suns and solar flares and stuff like that, it's all plasma. So plasma has been something that until relatively recently has been hard to get a hold of. It's hard to contain something that's super hot and you need magnetic fields and stuff like that. But if you can get a plasma form, you can start making fusion and there's a lot of other interesting things you can happen. So what's interesting, just like, a, like iron is kind of the end of things, which is kind of wild, plasma is actually the most common phase of matter in the whole universe. But here on the planet Earth, all right, this is in a weird place, an island, if you will, where we have more solids, liquids, and gases than anything else. So plasma is really neat. Now, plasma has been described as an electrically conducting fluid and the electrons kind of flow over the ions. And in order to have plasma, you have to have very strong magnetic and electric fields. And this is something that you can't really do easily here, like in most cases. You need a pretty fancy lab to make this happen. Um, here's a graphic showing some plasma sources. So again, every sun is basically a big plasma source, all right? But if you've ever, like if you saw the solar eclipse in 2017, the corona, that's basically like a plasma. Um, fluorescent light bulbs actually have a little bit of plasma inside them. Uh, lightning is a source of plasma on the earth and stuff like that. So there are some sources of plasma which exist naturally, but generally in a controlled environment like for making fusion, you've gotta have some pretty high tech equipment. However, I'm now gonna show a video uh, that some of my students made a couple years ago, and they claim they made plasma in their microwave. <laughs> That's a great one. There's a uh, match head. These guys, first of all, they were really cool people, all right? But anyway, they said, oh yeah, we can make plasma in a microwave. I'm like, what the? So I thought, oh, come on. So they made this video, and I was like, well, okay, something did happen there. So I did some research on it, because I thought, no way. 
you know, microwave, microwaves are much lower energy than, than other kinds of energy, of course, and, and a grape and stuff. Well, I did a little research and I don't know, maybe it is plasma. So I can't honestly explain what's happening there. They claim, and a lot of scientists claim that this is a way you can see plasma for a second there before it comes back down to earth. I can't explain it. I don't know if I'd recommend you try it at home because I don't know what to do to your microwave. But if you want to try it, they just cut the grape in half and put match heads inside and then put that container over it kind of to contain the energy. I don't know. Anyway, normally what people do when they want to have plasma is they have to create some kind of really high energy thing with gases and stuff. I mean, super hot, super magnetic fields. And in a fusion reactor, and we're talking here about a type of fusion reactor called the tokamak, which I think is the most common. The tokamak reactor has like a donut, if you will, and plasma is introduced, and the plasma essentially just circles around super, super fast. So all around this, this is the inside of the donut, over around you have this really strong magnetic fields, electric fields, and stuff like that. And from this energy then, you can make the atoms actually collide together to make fusion. So it takes a lot of energy to make the tokamak turn on, and the goal is to get more energy out of the tokamak once the energy's been turned on. And for a long time, that was really tough, but now, gosh, they're showing some real promising kind of results from it. So there's different kinds of fusion reactors. This is just the one that uh, I hear about most often, tokamak. This is from a company that wanted you to invest in them. They were going to do fusion, but I thought it was kind of a fun a science fiction-like reactor. Anyway, this is um, an example. I believe this is from San Francisco. This shows the inside of the tokamak. There's a person standing there, and this is the outside. So very sophisticated equipment. You know, you have to have really concentrated things. But what's really cool about this is they've had some real big results happen. That's the plasma in the tokamak. It's around the circle right there. I don't know how they got this video, by the way. I'm just amazed. But anyway, in 2015, uh, this German group said that they had created, they got more power out than they put in, which I thought was really cool. But now just this year, just this month even, wow, uh, the UK actually created this study, and they got 59 megajoules of energy out of this fusion reactor. And that's freaking awesome because again this is clean energy you know something happens just turn it off and you know the fusion goes or the plasma goes down to regular matter and you've got hydrogen running around but it's a lot better than the next one we're going to look at which is fission so i'm really hopeful that one day we're going to have most of our power fuse uh, through fusion and solar solar is awesome too don't get me wrong i love solar power too this is more of a chemical version of something i can talk about yeah how many zeros are in a megajoule? Oh, good call. Um, that's a great question. Uh, a mega is 10 to the 6, Juliana. So if this was 59, it would be like 59 times 10 to the 6, or 5.9 uh, times 10 to the 7th joule. So quite a bit of energy out, stuff like that, yeah. Good question. Mega is like the mega megabytes and stuff. It's one of the bigger projects that we haven't talked about. Really good question, yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I mean, like, would this ever be a practical use for clean energy? Like, is the, the cost to make the energy worth it? Yeah. Once they can get it sustained, then Keith, I, I think it's totally going to happen, all right? And this was the first group that was getting there, and now the UK people have actually gotten even closer. So. I am hopeful that, yeah, it's going to happen. It's not quite there yet, all right? Like, PGE doesn't have fusion reactors set up somewhere that they give us our local energy, okay? But um, it's, it's getting closer and closer, all right? Like, at first, it was just for a little bit they could do it, and now it's for longer amounts of periods they're getting it out. So I'm, I'm hopeful, okay. all right, optimistic, yeah. And what could 59 megajoules of energy, like, power? Like, 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 so yeah, um, so a kilowatt hour is what PGE uses to report. And 
um, there's a conversion between kilowatt hours and joules. And uh, if you email me, I'll send it to you. I honestly don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, when I was living by myself, I think I was using three kilowatt hours of, of energy per day. And I think that's like 10 to the third joules. But like, I should send that to you because I'm not totally sure. Yeah, but, um, but anyway, this amount is enough to, I think, to power more than a, a couple homes, all right, for like a day and stuff. So, um, so it's not an inconsequential amount. And that's why I'm hoping that one day, but, but it, it, it isn't there yet. Really good question. All right. So fusion, I think, is really going to be helpful one day. It's not there yet, but man, we're getting closer. I get really excited every time I see fusion. In the nuclear fission of uranium-235, a neutron collides with a uranium atom, causing it to fission into two smaller nuclei. On the average, three neutrons are emitted for every U-235 atom that divides. Fission is what you hear about more, and we have heard about more so far. And fission, unlike fusion, fusion is taking small elements and making something bigger. Fission is taking something big and making it smaller. So it's something beyond iron now. And when you make something break up, like what's happening here, uh, you need some kind of a bullet, if you will, and that's usually a neutron. So in fission, most of the time, they fire a neutron into some big atom. And this is uranium, uranium-235, the ones that the Iranians think are gonna be used only for peaceful purposes, but can also be used for nuclear weapons. Anyway, the U-235 is a great fissionable material. It breaks down readily, in this case, into a barium, into a krypton, and a couple more neutrons. So the energy comes from taking a big element and making it smaller, making it more, if you will, like iron. A um, Couple of things, though. Fission, you do need some kind of neutron to get the party started, to start the reaction. And one neutron usually creates more than one neutron on the end. So you go from one neutron to three neutrons, and three neutrons would go to nine neutrons, et cetera, et cetera, like that. If you're a Star Trek Discovery fan and you don't have to like Star Trek, uh, they were actually talking about this. It's like where the stuff actually lights up. Now, most of fission would look invisible. Right? There's no nothing that would show up in our in our eyes. But this is one type of radiation, which is a byproduct of fission that you do sometimes see. So there's not much to physically see, but you do get a lot of energy out. And if you get energy out, you can make steam turbines roll and stuff like that. If the mass of U-235 is less than the critical mass, no chain reaction will result. Most of the neutrons will escape to the surroundings. If the mass is critical, most of the neutrons will be captured by other U-235 atoms, and an uncontrollable chain reaction will occur. This is the explosion of a thermonuclear bomb. Fission has some real problems, though, relative to fusion. Now, the advantage of fission is that the technology is ready to rock and roll. All right, it's been used since the uh, 60s over in Idaho is the first commercial fission nuclear power plant. And you can see it, they were the first ones to create energy for household consumption. On the other hand, fission's had some big time problems. Number one problem is you've got to control those neutrons. If you don't control them, the reaction just keeps escalating faster and faster and faster. And an uncontrolled fission reaction is what creates then nuclear explosions and stuff like that. So number one thing, control your neutrons more than anything else. The second thing is that sometimes the products created in a fission reaction, real messy, all right? They're dangerous, you can't just plug them into the waterway and expect them to go away. So the products of fission are real tough to get rid of. And they talk about um, places to store the leftover material. Right now, uh, in the far southeastern corner of Washington on the Columbia River is the Hanford Reserv uh, Res uh, Reservoir area. And Hanford is basically one of the places that un 
it wasn't anticipated they would do this. It's actually storing a lot of nuclear waste material from stuff they did in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So uh, kind of crazy. That being said, a lot of the problems that happened with fission, we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, a lot of the problems and stuff have been overcome. And right now they feel there's about 400 nuclear fission plants in about 30 different countries. Uh, France is one of the leaders when it comes to fission, uh, stuff like that. The United States has a start-stop kind of uh, love affair with fission. Um, there was a documentary I watched here recently on nuclear fission that was pretty interesting, talking about the United States, but it is a place that sometimes people will get energy. Now in Oregon, uh, the Trojan Nuclear Power Plant, which was out kind of by St. Helens, Oregon at the time, uh, that was our one nuclear fission plant. And there was tons of controversy around it. And this guy named Lloyd Morbett from Portland was a real active person investigating it. Anyway, long story short, they decommissioned it and now they took the whole thing down. So if you go out there right now, I think they have like a park and they, you know, commiserate. But they used to have elaborate kind of like an OMSI exhibit. I remember going to this when I was younger and you could push the buttons and see what happens when you, oh, I didn't put the nuclear control rods down. And anyway, at the time I thought it was really fun, but uh, the problem was is then that the pollution uh, that was created from it was a real issue. So. Uh, Washington still has several. If you go from Olympia to the coast uh, on the western side, you go by, I think it's like a place of three of them or something like that. Located in the nuclear core of a fission reactor are fuel rods, moderator and coolant fluid, and control rods. Each fuel rod contains tiny pellets of uranium dioxide. In these hundreds of fuel rods, Fission occurs, producing an average of 2.5 neutrons per fission reaction. The fuel rods are surrounded by water, which acts as a moderator by colliding with the neutrons and slowing them to a low thermal level. The water absorbs the thermal energy, which is used to drive a steam turbine to generate electricity. The low energy neutrons enter other fuel rods and collide with uranium-235 nuclei, creating additional fission chain reactions and the release of more neutrons. The amount of low energy neutrons present is regulated by control rods made of boron, which are very effective at absorbing neutrons. These rods are raised out of or lowered into the core as needed to sustain the chain reaction at the desired level. So when it comes to nuclear power, when people talk about it, you have to remember that there's fission and fusion, all right? And fission, they have right now, and fusion is on its way. It's not here yet, but it's on its way. So fission has uses. So for example, the probes in astronomy that went out to Jupiter, Neptune, Uranus, stuff like that, they had essentially types of fission reactors inside them. And there's still, some of them are sending back information, which is just so cool. I can't even begin to tell you how neat that is. Um, and out there, you can't get like solar power because it's too far from the sun. So you really need some source of energy. So for those, then fission has been really, really useful. And there's definitely some people that have benefited. On the other hand, fission has had some what they call problem events. And here's the three main ones with one I'm going to throw in just because it's local to us. The first big problem event was in Pennsylvania in the late 70s, and it was Three Mile Island. And Three Mile Island came really close to a meltdown, apparently. And it was all technology-based, all right? Now remember, this is the 70s, all right? They didn't hardly have even computers at that time, or they had some, but they were massive. So the technology was pretty basic. But Three Mile Island was scary, all right? People that lived around it were evacuated and freaked out and stuff like that, so bad news. The real big one happened in 1986 in Chernobyl, which I mentioned earlier. This is where the Ukrainian forces were fighting the Russians here recently and stirred up all kinds of dust. Now, Chernobyl had real problems with meltdown. And if you watch that uh, Chernobyl series on HBO, it's somewhat fictional, somewhat factual. Amazing. Anyway, uh, real scary kind of stuff. And that area is still contaminated and stuff. You're not supposed to go in there. That's why I was kind of surprised they were fighting there. But anyway. The other big one that happened here recently, 2011, was in Japan, Fukushima Daiichi, I think is how you say it. But anyway, that place also had a problem. Um, there was an earthquake, and the tsunami that came in, came in and just wiped out lots of the things. And in the process, their facilities began to melt down too. And this is still a super radioactive area, gotta be careful and stuff. Supposedly, um, some of this has gotten over here to Oregon, all right, through the currents and stuff in the ocean, crazy. 
But also important is that, and people don't talk about this very much, in this place called Hanford, which again is southeast Washington and not that far, driving distance to Portland, right on the Columbia River, all of this nuclear waste is being stored. At Hanford, they worked on some of the nuclear powers for the bombs, but they've also, you know, they, there's a lot of good uses. They created some medical isotopes and stuff, but all this stuff has waste and they didn't ever figure out a good place to store it, so they just stored it there on site. And a lot of the tanks are breaking down and stuff. So, um, so fission uh, definitely has had some issues, all right? And in theory, you know, fusion, if anything happens, just shut it all down, all the plasma goes to regular matter, little hydrogen and helium, but that's not too bad. These things uh, are much more serious and they're ongoing too, which is kind of sad, so. So anyway, you can decide for yourself, of course, what you think is right. There's a lot of people that think that vision should come back. <clears throat> a lot of powerful lobbying efforts and stuff like that. So, any questions? Now, one of the heroes in this area that is not talked about as much as I think she should be, her name is Lise Mittner, and Element 109 was actually named after her. <clears throat> now, in the 30s, her and uh, Otto Hahn, Fritz, and this Otto Frisch guy, uh, they were the ones that actually understood and explained the idea of what fission is all about. And again, it's 1938, right before World War II. <clears throat> um, these men, of course, was a woman working in a field at the time which was very male-dominated. They did name Element 109 after her, which I thought was incredibly cool, <clears throat> uh, because she was definitely one of the high-power people in this particular section. Now, she, like Marie Curie, was forced to work in the basement, right? So it was in the best places. She never got the Nobel Prize for understanding fission, which is huge, all right? Fission is what is used to explain also solar cycles and, and stuff like that. So it's a huge thing, and, and it, she was never recognized for her work. Um, she was again, like Marie Curie, another really dominant uh, force when it comes to this stuff, a pioneering female in a male-dominated area. And she didn't get the credit. She was also a pacifist. So during World War II, she basically just moved to Switzerland and said, I, I'm not going for either side. And so neither side was very happy with her. And I think that's also one of the reasons why she's not mentioned as much. But anyway, she's a really interesting person. If you're bored, check her out. She's kind of cool. <clears throat> All right. Even some everyday objects contain radioactive sources. Let's see how a Geiger counter responds to these items. First, we look at the background reading. Listen for the rate of the counter clicks and observe the meter response. Smoke detectors use a shielded americium-241 source. Smoke detectors should never be disassembled, as has been shown here for demonstration purposes. Now we observe the response of the Geiger counter to a lantern mantle. Lantern mantles can be obtained at any sporting goods store. This brightly colored orange Fiesta Ware plate contains uranium oxide in the glaze. The radiation level is high enough to be dangerous if exposure is prolonged. A Geiger the blue Fiesta Ware plate has a non-radioactive glaze. Geiger counter is what's used a lot of times to detect radiation. Um, there's basically like a type of a gas inside, and the gas is neutral, argon or something like that. And as the radiation comes in, it ionizes some of the gas, so the cathode anode parts are activated. And when the activation happens, something you're click, 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 something like that. This one has a bell, and same idea. Um, a lot of things around us have radiation all the time. True story, I was in Walport, Oregon at kind of a shoddy secondhand store just looking around and stuff. <laughs> and anyway, my son, who was very young at the time, goes over and says, oh, look at these pretty orange plates. And I'm like, ah, because orange fiesta wear from the 60s was notorious for being radioactive. It was coated with a type of uranium paint, which looks really cool. It's radioactive. So I grabbed it, got it out of there as fast as I could. Man, I said, no, we're not dealing with this. So anyway, I know I'm a weirdo. But anyway, uh, just realize that uh, you don't see orange fiesta wear, at least with that orange paint anyway on it very much. Blue is always a safe color. But anyway, uh, I had a student a few years ago who went around Mount Hood with a guy counter testing out different things. And he found out that at the time there was a security system to go in and out of the bookstore, and that actually caused his uh, guy counter to go off. But he didn't find at the time any significant source of radiation on the campus. Woohoo! So, 
I know you're excited. Questions on the? Now, when it comes to health, there's a whole thing about radiation and health, all right? And remember that there's radiation around us all the time, okay? But if you're exposed to radiation, there are different ways that people talk about the radiation exposure level. And the first one we'll talk about here is called the Ronchin. It's the capital R symbol. And anyway, Ronchin is a measure of radiation that you get. An X-ray, a chest X-ray, about 0.1 Ronchin, all right? Now, there's more than that, though. A Ronchin equivalent for man or human, all right, is called a REM. And so sometimes you'll hear about radiation units in REM. Now, the one that I'll talk about more here than anything else is a Curie, all right, and this is just another type of a unit. Now, a Curie is equal to so many disintegrations per second. As the atom breaks down, it disintegrates or decomposes. So if you have a sample with 3.7 times 10 to the 10th decompositions or disintegrations per second, that's what a Curie is. Now each disintegration or decomposition comes from an individual atom. So in this case, you'd have 10 to the 10th atoms breaking down per second. And if you have 10 to the 23rd of these crazy things, that's not gonna affect your sample that much. So a Curie is actually something that can happen. Um, another unit you see sometimes is called a rad. That's equal to so many joules, all right? So 10 to the minus 5 joules from radiation is equal to a rad. And if, if everybody in this room received 450 rad, that would give us the LD50. Does anybody know what LD50 means? LD50 is a lethal dose 50% of the time. So if everybody in this room received 450 rads, half of us would be dead. <laughs> LD50 is something they use also in types of science to represent uh, areas. It stands for lethal dose 50% of the time. This stuff always freaks me out. <laughs> That's why I did basically inorganic things because everything was not gonna do this. But anyway, it is a cool thing to know that just so we wanna try and not have a lot of radiation, but again, there's radiation around us all the time too. So here's a question that might be something to think about. <clears throat> we should try to live as radiation-free as possible. And let's see which of these statements you agree or disagree with. First of all, yes, all radiation is bad and it's best to have no radiation exposure at all. What do you think about that? No, there, there's some radiation around us all the time, all right? All radiation is not bad. There's good uses for it too. It's used for x-rays and it's used for PET and stuff at OHSU. So there are good uses for it. You don't wanna necessarily run from it if there's a good reason for it. I mean, you don't wanna go exposing yourself, but that's okay. Yes, but we gather some radiation exposure naturally due to geological processes in the Earth and from space, so some radiation exposure is normal, natural, normal. You can probably imagine where I'm going with this. Of course, that's the right answer because there is some radiation around us all the time, all right? It comes from space, solar things. It comes from the Earth, some kind of geological stuff going on. So some radiation is normal, all right? If you fly, you get more radiation than if you don't fly, for example. The other ones are just silly. No, we'll trust the government. <laughs> no, said. B, no, I want to be like Peter Parker. Spider-Man, gamma radiation. No, I want to be like Bruce Banner. Gamma rays. All right, that would be fun, but that's really not appropriate for this class. So, so hopefully you can see how B is the best answer. Yeah. This is a, a stupid question. Uh, sorry. And you might not have the answer. Okay. Um, did the Fantastic Four get their powers from a fusion reactor, or am I making that up? Cosmic rays. That's a cool question. I'm <laughs> glad you did it. So in the original version of the Fantastic Four, anyway, they went into space and cosmic rays caused all their transformation. Now, if that was the original version. In some of the movie versions, like the one version, they went to the older planet and stuff, so I don't know about that. Cosmic rays are uh, particles that come from the sun. And so in the original version, anyway, that's what it was. But in subsequent versions, they may rewrite. I think that's a cool question, man. You're always wondering if that's good. Yeah, good. Other <laughs> questions? They're remaking the Fantastic Four school. Anyway, all right, prop that on, seriously. It's all right. all right. Okay, now, another thing you can do with nuclear stuff is you can transform matter, all right? 
And this has been a big thing too. Uh, some of the most recent elements to be created, for example, our periodic tables here in this room go up to basically 109 Mittnerium after Leeds Mittner, but they currently are up to 118 over there. And most of these super heavy elements, what they've done is they took two smaller elements and smashed them together. And they basically use either a linear accelerator or a cyclotron. There's different ways to do it. But a linear accelerator is just like a circuit. And you get them faster, 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 and then smash, they smash together. And they analyze the products as they come out, trying to see if any larger particles have been made. A cyclotron is, I don't understand cyclotrons as well, but it's basically like a type of a circle. All right, and you get the thing like kind of wound up and then you fire it into something and see if it has anything. In the 50s and 60s, cyclotrons were used a lot. Now it's more about the linear accelerators and stuff like that. And we'll see some examples of this. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture of CERN. And in Switzerland, they have this huge kind of circle, basically, thing. You can see in the circle right there. And that's the accelerator. So this huge circle, they're getting the particles faster, 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 faster. And then somewhere, they smash into other large particles and they analyze the products that come out, and some of the products have had really cool things. And this is useful not for just making larger molecules, which makes the chemists happy, but also in physics, a lot of the subatomic particles, they can detect through these kind of things. Um, there's a pretty big one of these, and I think it's Indiana. It's not as big as CERN in Switzerland, but it's still pretty big, and uh, it's really neat the kind of information they can get out of it. Um, when you look at the periodic table, all right, and remembering that iron is kind of the maximum, all right, most of what we have on the earth is kind of this stuff before iron, but we have a lot of elements past iron too. So for example, gold is an example of something that's pretty common. And astronomers will a lot of times use then uh, their ideas of how the uh, things happen to figure out where, how these elements were made. So for example, uh, gold right there is a purple one. They feel that's from merging neutron stars. So some of these elements they feel, and I don't know if I totally believe all of it yet, but they feel that neutron stars somehow collided and in those super powerful energetic reactions, some of these elements were created, which is just crazy, crazy, crazy. And then some of them are from low mass stars. Up to iron, they can understand it through regular novas and supernovas regular. But anyway, they feel that earlier on these things exploded, these suns exploded, and that's what created a lot of the elements. But the ones past iron, they had to do them. Here's cosmic rays, by the way. It's kind of the pink ones are cosmic ray vision. The cosmic rays themselves were enough to create it. Um, this is a term I'd not heard before, but a kilonova is when two neutron stars collide together. And this is becoming something they're talking about more in the astronomy world too, but these kilonovas are apparently responsible for some of the elements that we see on the Earth. For example, gold and stuff like that, which is just wild. But anyway, this is some of the areas in astronomy where astronomy and chemistry kind of overlap. They're just trying to explain how we have, for example, so much lead. Because lead is quite a ways past iron, the maximum thermodynamic thing. These are the ways they can use to explain how they have. What made MC not find cat? With the serendipitous DOB. This teaching is one of the slabs and themes. It's the place to introduce me to physics and beams. They accelerate nuclei, the protons and neutrons at the centers of atoms. We call them nucleons. Protons are the elements, it's chemistry. Neutron numbers affect elements with subtlety. They're defining the isotopes. And with effort, they hope to make some that no one's ever seen before. And that's dope. So you know the elements from the theory and it goes with this other version. How it's the isotopes that are stable. The isotopes we know are on a dying track. And in first glance, I thought it looked pretty wet. But as you get away from that stable nucleus slime, there's radioactive isotopes we don't usually find on Earth. Because the nuclei prefer to decay into more stable isotopes by passing particles away before they can. The teams here check out their dynamics, measure masses and lifetimes, and study their mechanics. With mysteries to solve it, but we yet to strive stars. And how do they evolve the strong force by a nuclear level? We still can't say exactly why some are stable, what others decay. A more powerful machine 
push the frontier. The physicists here, they get nuclear, nuclear, nuclear. So let's say you were making a new kind of nucleus, an effort, a fun facility that's long been discussed. The starting atoms, they're just ordinary, stable isotopes. They're easier to store and carry. You strip off their electrons for a charge state. Is it through electric fields meant to accelerate? Then you slam them into something. We call it the target. Five percent of your nuclei are gonna really get it. Those that do won't be different from your starting crew. They lost protons and neutrons, or maybe gained a few. All kinds of fragments have just been created. So you put them through a magnet, they can be in them separated. If it's got lots of protons, it takes an inside curve. But more neutrons tend to drag it for an outside swerve. You filter off the isotopes you don't want in the stream. And we'll not. You've got a bigger isotope beam. And to put your nucleus on the nuclear map, you'll then measure it in a detector or trap. This facility is for research and to teach so that you can be more than just a figure of speech. Your speech, your speech, your speech, your speech, your speech. This video goes on for quite a bit longer. And it's got some cool science, so that's why I showed it. But anyway, in this video, they showed some of those peninsulas of stability, which are basically surrounded by the unstable isotopes, and they're trying to look for more stable ones, or at least ones they can detect. And so they accelerate that thing in the cyclotron, whatever, they fire it into the target, they use the detector. Detectors are basically mass spectrometers, which we talked about, which are ways to find the molar mass of different pieces. Some of them are just around for a little tiny bit, and some of them are around for longer. But a lot of the elements, the most recent ones, have been found using these kind of systems. So uh, pretty cool. If this is anything you're interested in, this is from Michigan State. They do a lot of this kind of work. There are a couple institutions across the United States, but I fell in love with their little silly song there. So anyway, questions on? Uh, after graduating from uh, UCLA with a major in chemistry in 1934, I went to uh, Berkeley to obtain my PhD in chemistry uh, in 1937. And uh, then a few years later, I became involved uh, in the uh, research to synthesize and identify the uh, so-called trans-uranium elements. Uranium has the atomic number 92 and is the heaviest naturally occurring element and uh, what we uh, did was go on to produce by nuclear bombardment uh, elements with atomic numbers greater than 92. Uh, for example, 93, 94, 95, 96, and so forth. The most important one, of course, is the element with the atomic number 94, plutonium, which has the uh, fissionable isotope uh, that uh, is used uh, in atomic energy and was used in the atomic bomb that uh, brought an end to uh, World War II uh, when it was used at Nagasaki. Uh, we named uh, plutonium after the planet Pluto, just like uranium had been named after Uranus and neptunium after Neptune. Uh, we could have uh, given it the name plutium after the root Pluto, but we like plutonium better, and we should have given it the symbol PL, but we like PU better, and uh, we thought maybe we would be criticized for giving it that kind of a symbol. Um, we went on, after I moved to Chicago to work on the chemical processes for the separation of plutonium for its use in the atomic bomb, to the metallurgical laboratory of the University of Chicago, and here uh, we went on to discover the next two elements with the atomic numbers 95 and 96. And in order to do this, we had to predict the chemical properties using the periodic table, but the form of the periodic table at that time was wrong, and I changed it and uh, created the, the actinite concept for placing the heaviest elements in the periodic table. Uh, for this, I received the Nobel Prize in 1951. Uh, so that shows you how easy it is to uh, uh, do work that would uh, give you a Nobel Prize. One of the uh, elements uh, that uh, interests me uh, very much uh, that was synthesized 
uh, is the element with the atomic number 106, which has been given the name by the discoverers, of which I am one, Seaborgium, uh, with the symbol SG. Uh, the uh, Commission on Nomenclature of Inorganic Chemistry of the uh, International Union of Purified Chemistry that have to approve uh, this name uh, rejected it because I'm still alive and uh, they could prove it, but uh, there was such a universal uh, disapproval of that action uh, uh, that it now looks like the name Seaborgium for uh, element 106 is going to uh, remain. And of course, I'm very pleased about that. This is a very high honor. I think it's a greater honor than e even receiving the uh, uh, Nobel Prize because it, uh, it, it'll last forever. The name Seaborgium will be in the periodic table 100 years from now, 200 uh, years, 1,000 years from now. Actually, a total of uh, 20 transuranium elements have been synthesized since that first uh, synthesis of uh, element 93 and 94 and 1940 and 41. So that now we're up to element 112. And uh, it looks like it's going to be possible as the years go on uh, to uh, synthesize and identify perhaps another half dozen uh, transuranium elements. I think this will occur uh, after I'm gone, but uh, uh, perhaps during the lifetimes of many of you, and perhaps some of you will be uh, uh, involved in the discovery of these additional transuranium elements. Seaborg went to a community college in California and he didn't know what he wanted to do. And long story short, he ended up being one of the power pioneers of all these heavy elements. He's a really cool guy, but I did want to point out that he went to community college and he became really powerful and you guys can too. He's a really interesting person. He was the advisor to lots of different presidents, uh, stuff like that. But I'm running out of time, so we'll just continue on. I'm not going to show this video, but this is on carbon dating. Carbon dating usually involves carbon-14. Carbon-14 is uh, really cool. There's problems with carbon dating, and some people will say, oh, carbon dating doesn't work. Well, there's other ways to measure the length, uh, the time that something has been sitting besides carbon dating. It's all about half-lives. So you can see their symbol there for half-life, 5,730 years. Uh, which is really cool. And so carbon is in the hot light. Uh, there's a lot of controversy around it, but it is cool. And finally, I was going to show a video on nuclear chemistry and medicine, and PET and MRI are both used a lot. Uh, PET uses these positrons, which is really crazy. MRI isn't really a nuclear chemistry creator. It doesn't create like particles, but it does involve the nucleus. It involves making the spins run around, and they're both really, really helpful and stuff like that, blah, blah, blah. But that's it. That's it for nuclear science. Thanks for hanging out here, gang. Uh, Wednesday's class presentation day. Can't, look, can't wait to see them. Bring your paper, do your presentation just in front of this class. Uh, we don't have a lab or we don't have a problem set or quiz that week. You will turn in genetics one from last week. Questions on any of that? Have a great day.